Welcome to Electronic Materials. This video is the first part of Chapter 3. Okay, let me uh, give you first a brief overview of what we'll do in uh, Chapter 3, which is about elementary quantum physics. Maybe the most important part of this chapter is uh, the discussion of wave-particle duality of nature. We will see that light and electrons can both uh, manifest themselves as particles or as electromagnetic waves. That's, for example, shown in the uh, Young's experiment, where you can put either light or electrons through a double slit, and then you will get an interference pattern on a, a screen. So that shows that electrons can behave like electromagnetic waves. Another remarkable feature of quantum physics is the uncertainty principle. In the uncertainty principle, we will see that one cannot determine the location and the momentum of a particle at the same time with high precision. So if you know the momentum very well, then you don't know where the particle is, or if you know uh, where the particle is, then you don't really know what its uh, velocity or momentum is. We will see that one can predict this behavior with uh, the Schrödinger equation. The Schrödinger equation is a recipe that yields so-called wave functions that give us the probability to find a particle at a certain location in such experiments. We will initially solve the Schrödinger equation for the infinite potential well, and that will yield already some basic insight in the behavior of particles in quantum physics. We will see that the energy levels are quantized, and we will see that the probability to find a particle is defined by the absolute square of the wave function. So in the case of the infinite potential well, that means that the electrons are most likely where there are the bellies of the sine functions that are the solutions for the Schrödinger equation. Once we understand that, we will apply this to the hydrogen atom, and we will understand why we get discrete emission lines uh, from a hydrogen gas and, and other atoms. And then at the end of the chapter, we will briefly discuss how a laser functions. Okay, let's first discuss light. So I just said light can behave as electromagnetic wave or as particle depending on the experiment. So let's start with light as electromagnetic wave. Here you see an electromagnetic wave. Essentially, there is an emitter somewhere that puts out light and then this light propagates through space and time as such a wave that has a magnetic component, magnetic field component B, and a electric field component E. And so this propagates through space and it has a certain wavelength which corresponds to the color or energy that's in the light, we will see. Let's have a look how such a wave propagates through space. This here is an animation. So if you were in this spot here and the wave would come to you, then you would experience a variation of the electrical and the magnetic field vector as you see it here. If we put it in a formula, then it's a sine function multiplied with an amplitude. So the amplitude is just the size of the bellies here. And in the sine function, you have uh, the wave number multiplied with x. So the wave number essentially tells us how many uh, full cycles per length unit uh, minus the um, angular frequency multiplied with the time. So this gives us the time dependency, and this here gives us the dependency on the x-axis. If you divide the angular frequency by the wave number, you get the uh, speed of this wave, which is, of course, the speed of light. Equivalently, you could multiply the uh, frequency with the wavelength. It's interesting to note that the intensity of the light, which is really the uh, power density, en energy per time, uh, is dependent only on the square of the amplitude multiplied by the permittivity of a vacuum times the speed of light and then multiplied with one half. So the interesting thing here is that this does not depend on the uh, frequency of the light or the wavelength, just on the amplitude. This will be important once we discuss uh, light as a particle, so keep that in mind. 
So under what conditions can we experience light behaving as a wave? Well, there are interference, diffraction, refraction and reflection phenomena. A famous experiment that uh, demonstrates interference is Young's experiment. Here you see the schematic experimental setup. So Young put monochromatic light through a aperture that had two slits in it that are at a certain distance spaced from each other. And as the light passes these slits and hits a screen here, it produces a uh, interference pattern. Here you see it. So this is the red light, this green light and blue light. And so you see that the pattern of the red light has a wider spacing than the pattern of the green and the blue light. That of course depends on the wavelengths, right? Red light has a longer wavelength than blue light and that causes the interference pattern to be uh, spaced further apart. If you put white light through the double slit, then you get these uh, repeating rainbow patterns because you get the, all the colors uh, superimposed. So how does it work with constructive and destructive interference? Well, here you see the geometry. This here is the uh, double slit aperture. The slits are at a distance d. Here is the screen. And we assume that the light waves come in as a plane wave uh, parallel to the aperture. So that gives us a condition where the light going through the slits here has the same uh, phase. And then it all depends on uh, whether they are still in phase when they arrive on the uh, screen, the light waves that come from slit one and slit two. So in the case that I drew here, they have the same phase, so belly up matches belly up when they arrive at the uh, screen. So we would get a constructive interference spot here, so it would be bright. If we go to another spot nearby, where the phase difference would just be 180 degrees, so a belly up would meet a belly down of these two waves, then they would cancel each other and we would get destructive interference. The pattern can be calculated depending on the angle theta here. The path difference delta uh, must be equal to a multiple of the wavelengths if you want to get constructive interference. And the path difference is calculated easily by multiplying d with the sine of theta. There's an interesting application for Young's experiment, which is X-ray diffraction. X-rays are also just uh, electromagnetic light waves, just at a pretty high frequency. And that means they have a very short wavelength. And because of that, we can use them to check out the lattice spacing and the crystal lattices in general of uh, solid materials, crystals. This here shows a standard setup. It's called the Bragg-Brentano geometry for this experiment. So you have the sample on a sample holder that can be rotated and the X-ray gun is fixed and the detector is basically moved in concert with the sample but at a twice as fast uh, a speed, a twice as fast angular speed. That means that the incident and the exiting beam, they always have the same angle relative to the sample surface. And so that gives us this situation here. And because the X-rays come in at angle theta already and then leave at angle theta, we have this angle two times. And this, this means that uh, Bragg's uh, condition for constructive interference needs to be multiplied by two here because we get the path difference twice. This here shows two nice examples. This here is the uh, pattern that is obtained from a, a sodium chloride salt uh, single crystal. And so you see a very well defined spots that correspond to certain uh, lattice planes. If you do a similar experiment on the powder of a crystalline material, then you have a lot of small crystals oriented in random orientations. And then of course you don't get this nice pattern anymore, but you get rings, right? Because imagine this here just rotated uh, 360, then all these individual spots here, they would actually make rings. And this is what you see here. And in this case, typically the pattern is shown as a spectrum. And so this here is just the angle two theta through this pattern. 
and um, that's that's what you get here. So each of these rings is one of these peaks, and these peaks can be assigned to certain uh, lattice planes. This can, for example, be used to identify a material simply based on the uh, fingerprint uh, of this pattern that is typical for each uh, chemical compound. Okay, we just saw some nice demonstrations of the wave nature of light. When it comes to demonstrating that light can also behave as a particle, as a photon, as we will call it, then uh, things get a little bit more difficult and that's why we first need to discuss a few concepts. So let's start out with the concept of ionization energy. Let's go back to the uh, hydrogen atom Bohr's model, shell model. And so we remember that electrons have certain energies because they are on these uh, shells. And let's say now the electron is in the ground state on the 1s orbit. And so it would take a certain energy to remove this electron from the uh, a proton that uh, holds it down in that uh, ground state. And so if we give this electron now a certain energy, I put here three cases, E1, E2, E3. So if we would, if we would just give it E1, and when I say give, then I mean we, sh we shine light on the atom or we create some collisions by shooting something at it. So anyway, if we give this electron somehow energy, let's give it E1, then it would go on a higher state and then after a while, decay again back on the uh, ground state, so it would still be uh, bonded. If we give it E3, then we would create a free electron that would have some kinetic energy, that would have a velocity, so it could move about and do whatever it wants. So in this case, the kinetic energy would be the energy that's left over after overcoming the ionization energy the minimum energy to make it out of the grip of the uh, proton that uh, binds the electron. So if we would give it just the ionization energy, what would happen is we could remove the electron essentially to infinity and then it would rest there at um, kinetic energy zero. Right, No energy left, all energy would have been spent to make it out of the ground state all the way well, far away from the proton. So that's the ionization energy, minimum energy to make it away from the grip of the attracting nucleus. Okay, now you understand what it costs in energy to remove an electron from an atom. Now let's transfer this concept to a solid body, to a metal crystal. And so in this case, if you remember, if we have metallic bonding, the valence electrons form a free electron gas between the positively charged metal ions. And so now we ask the question, so how is it here? How much energy does it cost to remove an electron from uh, this crystal? And so it's very similar to the atom, except that now the electron is removed from the electron gas. But since we have the positive ions here, the electron gas is still attracted by Coulomb forces. And so if we want to pull out an electron, we still have to work against Coulomb forces. It's important to consider that matter in general is electrically neutral, right? You have the same amount of positive charges and negative charges. So if we remove an electron, there will be one positive charge too many in this crystal. And that's the force that we experience between the electron and the uh, crystal as we move the electron away. There's one major difference between this situation and the situation of a, a single isolated atom. The energy that it takes to remove the electron is lower in comparison to a typical ionization energy of an individual atom. The reason for that is that the positive charge that's left behind here is screened by the electron gas, by this negative charge that is floating around around the positive ions. 
and that reduces the attractive Coulomb forces between the electron and that left behind positive charge of the uh, crystal. Down here you see the energy diagram of this process. It's very similar to what we just saw for the isolated atom. The electron of the electron gas that is uh, at its energy level. The energy level is has an ionization energy of phi. In this case now it's called work function because we're talking about a solid body. So this work function needs to be overcome and we can shoot in a light wave here or use some other method. We could, for example, bombard the sample surface with an electron beam and give this electron here some energy. And if it has enough energy to overcome the work function, then uh, the remainder of it is kinetic energy and the electron then can move away from the uh, surface of this uh, crystal. Before we can discuss the photoelectric effect, there is one more concept I need to introduce here. I just talked about giving that electron some energy and then uh, knocking it out of the atom or the uh, metal crystal. Here now I want to discuss how much energy are we conveying to a surface when we irradiate it with some light. And the concept of intensity is such that if you have a light source, the uh, radiation spreads out from that, from that source and when you put a surface here, then you get a certain density of energy per second and area that is impinging. And if you go further away, then this intensity, even if the source doesn't change at all, you, you just go further away, the intensity gets weaker and weaker the farther you are away. This is simply because the energy spreads out over a larger area as the uh, sphere that we're drawing around the source here gets larger and the area of course increases with the distance uh, squared uh, on a, a sphere. This here is the formula for the intensity. I uh, introduced that already earlier in this presentation, but let's have a look at it again. So we multiply here the speed of light with the permittivity of vacuum and the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave uh, squared. Let's have a look at the units of the intensity and that will tell us immediately what we're having here. So the speed of light of course has meter per second. The permittivity of vacuum we can uh, look up, so that's farad per meter. And the electric field is of course volt per meter, and in this case now squared. And farad is a coulomb per volt, and if we simplify this here, then we get coulomb times volts divided by seconds meter squared and coulomb times volts, right? This is basically the energy that a charge has accelerated by a voltage that is joules. And so we have joules per seconds per square meter. So energy per area per time. You could also think of it, of course, as power per area. When you think of this, you know, we have a surface and electrons are uh, in here because we have the electron gas. It's of course a little bit difficult here to say the energy density is such and that means each electron gets X energy because we don't really know how this transfer uh, uh, functions and how big the electron is here and how much of that energy the electron actually can capture. But we can certainly say that the uh, intensity will be proportional to the energy that each electron gets that is in that uh, surface where the uh, light uh, impinges. Let's remember for the slides that are coming up that the energy the electron gets is proportional to the intensity of the light. So if we ramp up the intensity by a factor two, then we can assume that the electron will get twice the energy. So that's an important point when we discuss the photoelectric effect. The other very important point, and I said that already earlier, is that this formula here does not depend at all at the uh, frequency of the light, right? It only depends on the amplitude, but not at all on the wave number or the uh, angular uh, frequency. So the color of the light has no influence here on this intensity formula. So this is also an important point when we try to understand the photoelectric effect.
And with this we are finally ready to discuss the photoelectric effect. So let's look at the experiment. Here you see the schematic of the experimental setup. We have an evacuated glass tube, quartz tube, and in that tube we have two electrodes, a cathode and the anode. The anode is here to collect electrons. The cathode is where the experiment is mainly happening. So the cathode is illuminated by a light source and it's a monochromatic light source so we can tune the color of the light, the frequency of the light, as well as the intensity that is impinging on the uh, cathode. And you know by now if the intensity is high enough of this light then we would expect some electrons to emerge from that cathode, electrons with a certain kinetic energy that should depend on the intensity of the light that hits the cathode. Now these electrons now they emerge here into the vacuum in this quartz tube and some of them will make it over here to the anode by themselves if they fly in the right directions. Others will hit the wall and then somehow get lost. And so we can also apply a voltage to this anode, an accelerating potential, and with this we can suck electrons towards the anode and maximize the current that we get on the, on the anode. We can also uh, reverse the polarity of this uh, power supply that is connected here and we can create a retarding potential and with that we can essentially push the electrons back into the cathode and uh, stop the current flow to the anode. But when electrons arrive at the anode then uh, we will measure a current in the circuit, right? Because they came from the cathode, go into the anode and then go back into the uh, cathode. And this current is called the photocurrent. Now let's see what hypothetical results we would expect if the light behaves like an electromagnetic wave. So this is this graph here. So on the x-axis we have the applied voltage between anode and cathode. Here in negative direction we have the retarding potential which pushes the electrons back towards the cathode and in positive direction we have the accelerating potential, right? Because if we apply a positive voltage here we suck the electrons over. Let's consider first an experiment where we ramp up the light intensity from zero and then observe uh, what happens uh, on the uh, amp meter here. At very low intensities, of course, we would have a situation where the electrons don't have enough energy to overcome the work function and so we would simply measure nothing, right? We would get a zero current. And then as we go to higher intensities, at some point we would end up at the threshold here marked in red and first electrons would emerge from the uh, cathode but they would basically have uh, zero kinetic energy or very very little kinetic energy so most of them would get lost and we would measure a really tiny current on the anode. That would put us here just barely above the uh, zero on the uh, photocurrent axis. Now if we start applying an accelerating potential we would start collecting more of these electrons that just make it barely out of the cathode and Gradually, as we increase the potential, we would max out the current and then at some point we would reach this saturation plateau where we pretty much collect all of the electrons that come out of the cathode. But even at higher accelerating potentials, we would not get more current because the number of electrons is now constant. After having measured this curve, we measure two more curves at even higher intensities. So we put a little bit more intensity in with the second curve and then the maximum intensity here on the uh, third curve. And on these curves, of course, because we are exceeding the threshold energy the, or the work function, we would expect that we already start out at a sizable current even if we don't apply an accelerating potential and that's what we see here. Right, so these two green curves that correspond to these two uh, intensities, here we would expect photocurrent that is significant already at a zero applied voltage because the electrons have some kinetic energy now that can carry them over here to the anode. Now even in these cases apl the application of an accelerating potential will bring us uh, more current because even 
if the electrons have some kinetic energy, some still get lost without a potential that collects them here. So these parts of the curves look similar to this, but they simply start out at a higher current. Now let's consider what happens if we apply a retarding potential. In this case, of course, because it drives the electrons back to the cathode, we would expect as we ramp up this potential that we would gradually zero out the current for these two curves. So the bottom line of this part of the experiment would be that we would have a dependency between the retarding potential and the light intensity. Right? The higher the light intensity, the higher the retarding potential to cancel out the uh, current. Now let's do a third experiment. Let's vary the color of the light, the uh, frequency. And when we do that, since the formula for the light intensity does not contain the uh, wavelengths of the light or the, the frequency, we would expect no change in these curves. So we should be measuring the same curves whether the light is blue or ultraviolet or red. Nothing should matter here in terms of the color of the light. Only the intensity should have an influence here. So in summary, if the light is an electromagnetic wave in this experiment, would behave as an electromagnetic wave in this experiment, we would have that characteristic threshold intensity at which we would only start measuring a current. So this would give us the red curve. If we go to higher light intensities, then we would have this situation here where we would need ever higher retarding potentials to quench the current because the energy of the electrons would depend on the light intensity and we wouldn't see any dependence on the color of the light. So this is what we would get if light would behave like an electromagnetic wave in this experiment. Okay, now let's see what really happens in this experiment. So if we do the same experiment again, here, uh, varying the intensity, what we see is that all of these curves start out at the same retarding potential. So independent of the light intensity here, we get curves that all start out at the same retarding potential. The only difference, depending on the intensity, is that the current varies depending on the intensity. So it seems the intensity goes up, we get more electrons, but each of the electrons that come out of the cathode at low and at high intensity, they all have the same energy because we can quench them out with the same voltage, independent on the intensity. So the intensity seems to have no influence on the energy of the electrons. The intensity is only responsible for the number of electrons that come out of the cathode. So this here is already in complete disagreement with that assumption of an electromagnetic wave that we uh, put to the test on the previous slide. The second remarkable result of this experiment is that the retarding potential actually depends on the frequency of the light. And it depends in a way that at low light uh, frequencies or long wavelengths we need a smaller retarding potential and at higher uh, frequencies of the light or shorter wavelengths we need a larger potential. So this here shows us that the energy of the electrons that come from the cathodes seems to depend on the frequency of the light and that higher frequencies give the electron more energy than uh, lower frequencies. In this experiment one also sees a threshold frequency below which there is no more current to be measured. So that seems to uh, corroborate that at a certain frequency the energy of the electrons is too low to overcome the uh, work function. So in summary, this experiment shows that the energy that's given to the electrons is related to the frequency and that the intensity only determines how many electrons come out of the cathode. So these are the two very important results of this experiment and they completely disagree with the assumption that we have an electromagnetic wave here. So how are these experimental results explained? Well, that's done by introducing wave packets or so-called photons so here we assume that the intensity of the light is simply given by the number of particles that hit the surface per area and per time 
and that each of these particles has an energy that depends on the uh, frequency of the of the light so the energy of the photon is just a constant multiplied with the frequency and the constant h that is uh, Planck's constant so we have now particles that have an energy that depends on the light frequency and with this we can explain all these results that we just saw on the uh, previous page for example, the fact that there is no threshold intensity to measure current can be explained by this by simply saying, well, if one photon hits the surface, there should still be one electron then that receives enough energy and uh, that can leave the surface and so we should get a very small current. The fact that the intensity of the light doesn't influence the kinetic energy of the electrons is also explained by this because if we assume that each photon only interacts with one electron then of course these electrons always should get the same uh, kinetic energy no matter how many uh, photons impinge on the uh, surface. So now that we know that the uh, energy of the photon is Planck's number times the frequency uh, we can calculate the kinetic energy by simply subtracting the work function from that photon energy. So we get this simple equation here that says kinetic energy is h times nu minus the work function. Based on the uh, formula that we just determined for the kinetic energy of the electron, which is the photon energy minus the work function, we can actually determine the work function for various materials and we can also measure the uh, Planck's constant. So here on this graph you see the kinetic energy of the electrons plotted versus the frequency of the light that is impinging on the uh, cathode. The experiment was performed for cathodes made from different materials and these are the curves that resulted. So how are these curves measured? How do we get the kinetic energy for a particular light frequency? Well, we simply apply the retarding potential and we measure at what voltage is the current zero and that, of course, is the kinetic energy of the electrons that are produced at that particular frequency. And so we do this for a few points on these curves and then we fit a line through them. So if we extend the lines to the uh, y-axis to determine the intercept, this here gives us the work function, right? Because that's just that term that is uh, subtracted here in the equation. Of course, we can also determine Planck's constant from these experiments by determining the slope of these uh, lines. It's interesting to note that only for the low work function materials here, we can use visible light for these experiments. Down here is a table that shows us the energies of the photons uh, at different colors of visible light. And so you see here that violet light, which is the highest photon energy that we can see, uh, the frequency is around three electron volts, while uh, red light has an energy that is below two electron volts. And so if the work function is higher than three electron volts then of course we cannot get electrons out of the sample anymore with visible light and we have to go to ultraviolet light in order to measure the work function of those higher work function materials right platinum if you look at it has more than six electron volts and uh, of course that you could never see with a, a three electron volt violet uh, photon we just saw that light is made up of photons and we can think of them as light particles. So an interesting question is, do photons also have momentum? And that brings us to the Compton effect. This here shows the experimental setup to measure the Compton effect. There's an X-ray source, with that we shoot at a graphite target. And then we have a detector that can be driven around the target and depending on the angle here, we measure X-ray spectra. Down here you see three of these spectra. They are measured at different angles theta. So this spectrum here is measured right behind the sample, theta zero. And then these two spectra are measured at 45 degrees and at 90 degrees. So what do we see here? 
The x-axis here, that's the wavelength, and so the longer the wavelengths, the uh, lower the energy of the x-ray photons that, that are coming in here, right? Because that would be a uh, smaller frequency, longer wavelengths. So what we see, if we go from 0 to 45, is that there is a second peak emerging. And this peak here, that's photons that have lost some energy. And if we go to a larger theta, then this energy loss gets even bigger. And so this shift here is called the Compton shift. So it seems that some of the photons that hit the target and change their direction uh, after they hit the target, they also suffer an energy loss. And this energy loss gets larger the more their direction changes. Compton explained the emergence of this peak by assuming that the X-ray photons are particles that transfer energy to the electrons in the graphite samples via a momentum exchange. This here shows what's going on. So we have the incoming photon from the X-ray gun that has a certain wavelength or frequency and then it hits an electron inside the uh, graphite target and the photon gets scattered by that event and it has a new lower uh, frequency or a longer wavelength. And the energy difference between the incoming photon and the outgoing photon that is uh, transferred to the electron. So the electron gains kinetic energy, which is the difference between the two uh, photon energies incoming and outgoing. The momentum of the photons can be calculated with this formula here. So you just have the momentum is equal to Planck's number divided by the uh, wavelength. So these are the two important uh, equations that you should keep in mind after uh, chapter three when it comes to photons. Momentum is h divided by wavelength and the energy is h times the uh, frequency. Okay, now let's turn this game around. We just saw that light waves can behave as light particles. Now let's ask the question, can electrons that we normally view as particles also behave as waves? And it turns out that one can do Young's experiment with electrons too. And so this here is the experimental setup. It's in a, a vacuum uh, a chamber because electrons need vacuum if we want to um, shoot them through a double slit. And so here this is an electron gun Essentially, that's just a filament that's heated up that emits electrons and then the electrons are being accelerated with this accelerating potential, 50 kilovolts, but that can be any voltage. And then uh, we shoot the electrons through an aperture and uh, then onto a double slit. And after the double slit, we put a fluorescent screen. So that's just a, a glass uh, that's coated with phosphorus. And when the electrons hit that fluorescent screen, then uh, light is emitted. And so we can then look from the other side onto the screen and detect the diffraction pattern. And so this here is a pattern that was generated by electrons. So it seems that electrons also can behave like electromagnetic waves and make a diffraction pattern. It turns out that the uh, wavelengths can be calculated from the momentum with the same equation that we just saw on the previous slide about the Compton effect. Uh, we just divide uh, Planck's number by the momentum of the electrons and the momentum here is of course just mass times the velocity that comes from this accelerating potential and this is called the de Broglie relationship. Let's calculate two examples of the Broglie wavelengths. The first example is a 50 gram golf ball at 20 meters per second. And so we just use the, the Broglie relationship and uh, plug in Planck's number 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34th divided by the mass of the golf ball 50 grams and the velocity 20 meters per second. Conveniently that's just one. And so we get a wavelength of 6.6 .6 times 10 to the minus 34 meters. So that is a really, really small wavelength. And that explains that the wavelength of real life objects that have a mass that we can appreciate is much too small for seeing any uh, noticeable diffraction patterns. 
Now let's look at an electron at 100 electron volts, so accelerated by 100 volt potential in contrast to that. So the kinetic energy of the electron is 100 electron volts and we can convert that to joules by simply multiplying the 100 volts with the electron uh, charge 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 coulomb and so we get 1.602 times 10 to the minus 17 joule for the kinetic energy of this electron. The momentum we can calculate by this formula where we just put the kinetic energy under square root multiplied with 2m, 2 times the mass, the electron mass. So we plug in the electron mass 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms and multiply with the uh, kinetic energy that we just calculated up there. And so we end up with a momentum of 5.4 times 10 to the minus 24 kilogram meter per second. So with this now we can calculate the wavelength. And with this we get 1.22 times 10 to the minus 10 meters, which is 0.12 nanometers. And that is of course a much, much longer wavelength than the 10 to the minus uh, 34 we got up there for the golf ball. So a lighter object has a much longer wavelength. And if you remember the distance between atoms in a crystal or the, just the size of atoms, this here is just a few times larger than the size of your average atom. And so one can suspect that a crystal lattice, similar like with X-ray diffraction, would cause some diffraction here with these electrons. That this works can be demonstrated with a so-called low energy electron diffraction setup. Here you see the experiment. There is the electron gun. The electrons get accelerated towards the sample surface with an applied potential, so this would be set to the 100 volts. And then the electrons that hit the uh, sample surface, they get scattered back towards the fluorescent screen where they form the uh, diffraction pattern. This diffraction pattern can be viewed through a optical viewport in the uh, vacuum chamber that houses this setup. This has to happen in vacuum because otherwise the electrons couldn't make it to the sample surface. This here shows a typical pattern that you would see with, with such a setup. This was measured on a silicon 7x7 surface. So that's the same uh, surface that uh, I showed you scanning tunneling microscopy pictures from. And you see again this beautiful 7x7 seven seven, uh, pattern that comes from the surface reconstruction of the silicon surface. This here is the uh, geometry. So the beam comes in, the electrons come in. They get uh, scattered at the uh, atoms that are in the top layer of the sample surface and then they uh, fly back to the fluorescent screen where they interfere and make the uh, diffraction pattern. So it's interesting to note here that the lattice parameter, the distance between the silicon atoms, is about half a nanometer which is uh, just a factor two or three uh, smaller than the uh, wavelength of the uh, electrons. And this here demonstrates that if one wants to see a pattern that is visible with the bare eye, you need to have a scattering object that has about the same size that as the uh, wavelength of the uh, electrons that come in. In this context, it's interesting to go back to the, the Broglie double slit experiment that's featured in the CASAP book. And this pattern that is shown there, that is coming from a paper written by Johnson and co-workers in the American Journal of Physics from 1974. And in the experimental description in this paper, they state that this pattern was produced with an electron beam at 50,000 electron volts, so with a wavelength of only 0.005 nanometer, so this is two magnitudes shorter than the electrons in the uh, previous uh, experiment that I showed you, while the slits that they used, they were spaced about 500 nanometers apart, because it's really difficult to make such slits that are very closely spaced. So they have this pretty big mismatch here between 
the very short wavelengths of the electrons and the fairly coarse pattern that they used as the diffracting uh, uh, double slit. Here there are four magnitudes difference in size and so this predicts that this pattern that is shown uh, is very very uh, small and the features are very close together so this must have been uh, obtained by looking through a pretty strong microscope. So this got me interested and I obtained the uh, paper this picture was taken from from the library and uh, here I want to share a few of the uh, pictures that are in this uh, paper. It's pretty interesting how they did this experiment. So the slit uh, aperture that was produced uh, with a lithography process. They started out with a 200 angstrom silver layer on a glass plate and then they deposited with an electron beam, they deposited lines of carbon on top of the silver. This uh, works with an uh, electron gun that has a beam that one can sweep and so they simply swept it in, in a line pattern across the uh, silver surface and that deposited some carbon that is uh, in the uh, vacuum chamber that houses this electron gun, uh, just uh, coming from pump oil and such things. It's just contamination and they deposit that with the electron beam on the uh, silver surface. Once that was done, they deposited uh, 5,000 angstroms of copper on top of this with electro deposition and since electro deposition needs a current to flow to deposit copper these uh, carbon lines that uh, were on the silver surface they insulated the process and therefore copper was only deposited in between those carbon lines so the carbon lines essentially ask as a mask for the uh, copper deposition the next step and final step was to peel off this copper film from the uh, silver surface and with that they ended up with a, a thin copper film that had these uh, uh, slits in it and this is essentially the aperture that they used for the double slit experiment here you see two scanning electron microscopy images of these uh, slits. So this here are the open areas in the uh, copper film. So you see they are a little bit wiggly and it's not really perfect. And I'm pretty certain that they did this a few times until they got it right. So over here you see the apparatus that was used for producing the diffraction pattern. And so this is essentially a fancy electron gun with some focusing elements here that project the beam on the uh, foil with the slits. And then after that we have a pretty powerful electron lens that magnifies the pattern by a factor 100 onto a fluorescent screen. And then the fluorescent screen was observed through a optical microscope with a power of 10. And then finally it was possible to take a well-resolved picture of these uh, diffraction patterns. So you see that this mismatch between the uh, lengths of the uh, uh, waves and the uh, uh, slit pattern that uh, created a really narrow pattern and a lot of experimental effort had to be done in order to uh, see this pattern with a good resolution. So at this point we have some experimental evidence that electrons can behave as waves. But of course it's difficult now to close the loop uh, because electrons are electrons, they are not electromagnetic waves. And why do we get a pattern that suggests that electrons are wave but they are not electromagnetic waves like light is? Uh, in fact you can do this uh, experiment here, this uh, the Young's experiment with electrons with such a low electron current here that never two electrons go at the same time through these slits yet you still get the diffraction pattern. So something else must be happening here. Something that has to do rather with a probability to find the electron somewhere and this probability somehow seems to be wavy suggesting that there is a probability wave and that was uh, suggested by Max Born in 1924 and he said well look at the intensity formula here um, the 
the uh, intensity depends on the amplitude squared of the electromagnetic wave on the uh, screen in the in the in, in Young's experiment. So why don't we say that the electron the electron's behavior is governed by a similar wave, but we call it a wave function. And this wave function, if we take the square of it, so in analogy of taking the square of the um, uh, amplitude of the electromagnetic wave, so how about if we take the square of that uh, wave function, the absolute square, and then that is the probability to find a particle somewhere. And it turns out that this uh, was right on. One can calculate such wave functions uh, and then take the uh, absolute square and that predicts very well um, where the electrons uh, hang out in space and time. Okay, now let's see how we can get those wave functions for the electron. So wave functions can be calculated using the Schrödinger equation. The Schrödinger equation is a fundamental equation that cannot be mathematically proven, but it describes the experimental results and that's why we like to use it. So it's, it's similar to Newton's second law F equals M times A, M times the acceleration. Uh, one cannot mathematically prove this either, but if you do a few experiments, you'll see that it holds, and so that's why we use it. So here with the Schrödinger equation, exactly the same thing. S look at it as a recipe to obtain that wave function if you have an electron that is in a certain potential V that influences its uh, motion. So this is a second order differential equation. So we have here the second derivative of the wave function. Uh, in in x direction, so this is the one-dimensional form, and that is added with uh, two times the electron mass divided by Planck's constant bar squared. Planck's constant bar is the Planck constant divided by two pi, and that is multiplied here with the difference between the electron energy and the uh, potential that it is in, and that's multiplied with the wave function, and that needs to be zero. So if we solve this equation for the wave function psi here, then, um, well, we get the wave function as solutions and then we have them. And then we can take the absolute square and determine the possibility. And then we can take the absolute square of the wave function and then we know the probabilities where to find the electrons. Of course, one can also do this in three dimensions. And then you have the uh, partial derivatives in x, y, and z instead of the second derivative of the uh, wave functions. Now, this is the time-independent form of the Schrödinger equation, but that's all we need at this point because for the examples that we're looking at here, uh, the potential is time-independent and uh, in such cases, it's enough to consider the time-independent form of the Schrödinger equation. Before we calculate our first wave functions, one more thing that I need to discuss here about the uh, wave functions as solutions of the Schrödinger equation. The wave functions, they cannot have a break like this here, so they need to be continuous all over x. And likewise, the uh, first derivatives need to be continuous too. So we cannot have derivatives that have a kink in it like, like this here. So the wave functions essentially need to be smooth themselves and their first derivatives need to be smooth also across the entire x-axis. And of course, the uh, uh, wave functions uh, must be single-valued, so it wouldn't be possible to have a solution that has uh, several um, values for an x value. Okay, let's calculate a wave function. So our goal is to figure out what happens to an electron once it is confined by an electrical potential. And since solving um, second order differential equations can be a little bit taxing for complicated problems, we start out with a super easy one which is the so-called infinite potential well. And what we assume here is that the electron is in a space that is without potential, so V is zero in here, and on the outside the potential is infinite. 
And the great feature about this uh, problem is that we can already say what is the wave function on the outside here. Well, you know it because the potential is infinite, the electron will certainly never go there and so the wave function is zero in those outer regions. And so we're left with calculating the wave function on the inside. So this is the Schrodinger equation, I just showed it to you. And so we have here the uh, potential and in the region between the two infinite walls, V is zero, so it gets reduced to um, the Schrodinger equation without the potential in it. Now let's do a little trick and replace that factor and the energy with uh, k squared. And then we can write the differential equation in this form. And you probably know this form already because it is very similar or identical to the uh, differential equation that we know already from the harmonic oscillator. And the solutions of the harmonic oscillator, you know them, are sine or and cosine functions. And the general solution is a linear combination of the sine and cosine solutions multiplied with uh, uh, factors a and b. So we can just grab this here and say, okay, that's also the solution for our wave function, except that instead of the angular frequency, we have now uh, k under the sine and cosine functions. So now that we know the general solution, what's left is to determine a, b, and k, or rather the uh, uh, energy E, because that's what interests us in the end. We can start out now, now by using the boundary conditions for the wave functions at the bottom of the box, because we know that uh, the uh, wave function will be zero at the border. So we can say wave function at zero is zero, and that must be um, equal to the uh, general solution here at the point zero and sine of zero is zero, so that takes out this here. And here on the other side, we can only uh, make this here zero if uh, b is zero, because cosine of zero is one. And that uh, already yields here that b is zero. So that reduces our solution to a times sine kx. The next step is to leverage the boundary condition on the other side of the uh, box at A, because we also know that um, the wave function at A needs to be zero, and so we can equate zero with A times sine Ka, right, the wave function solution at point A. And this is of course only valid if we have the condition fulfilled that k times a is a multiple of pi or, or zero, because only then the sine function can be zero. And so it follows that we get a bunch of k values that we can number with n, and so we have kn is equal to n times pi divided by a, and n going from 1, 2, 3 to infinity. So these are the allowed k values. Only sine functions with k values like that are zero on both sides here. And that's why only they can be solutions uh, for the uh, Schrodinger equation for this problem. One more point, uh, why don't we allow zero for n? Well, if we would allow zero for n, then the wave function would be zero everywhere uh, inside the box. And that would then of course say there is no electron in it at all. So it doesn't make sense as a solution. So what's left to do? This, this is what we have so far. So the wave function is a times sine n pi divided by a times x. Obviously what's left is we need to find the a. And a we get from the normalization condition. Basically we need to scale now these functions that they are absolute square and the integral over that does not exceed one because we need to have a probability to find the particle anywhere in the box that is one. And so here you see it, this is the normalization condition. So we take the integral from zero to a over the wave function, the absolute square of it in the x. So after we fill in the solution that we have so far, we get this. And constants in integrals you can pull in front of the integral and then solve what's left. 
And so um, sine square is a standard integral. We can look that up and we get here uh, this solution. So we have the absolute square of a times uh, 1 half x minus 1 divided by 4k sine square 2 times n pi divided by a times x. And this year now we need to evaluate uh, between 0 and a. And if we plug in 0 for x, of course everything is 0. And for a we get uh, 1 half times a minus 1 divided by 4k sine square of uh, 2 n times pi divided by a times a. And so the a's here can be divided out. So we're left with this here. And immediately you see that this is of course also a zero for uh, n's that uh, go from 1 to 3 to infinity. So we're left with uh, 1 half a as solution of this uh, integral. And so we simply need to solve this now here for uh, the constant a that we're looking for. And of course we get two solutions, uh, plus or minus uh, square root of 2 divided by a. Uh, solve this here. And since we take the absolute square, we can use either one of these solutions. We will get exactly the same uh, probability functions. And so we uh, take the uh, positive one and plug it into our solution and that uh, gives this here and so this is now the um, that's the wave function of the electron in the infinite potential well. So now we can basically tell where the electron will be right imagine these functions here squared and then where the square of the function is maximum uh, we can say the electron will most likely be there. What's left is we need to calculate the E values that correspond to those uh, K values that depend on N. Okay, so how do we get these energy values that correspond to the wave functions? Well, if you remember how we started out with the general solution, we simplified it by uh, saying K squared is uh, 2 times the electron mass times the electron energy divided by Planck's constant bar squared. And this here now we can solve for E and do it indexed, right? So we can, uh, here we get values for En that depend on Kn. And if we plug in uh, Kn is uh, n times pi divided by A, what we just determined earlier, uh, then we get this here. And if we further simplify it by replacing the Planck's constant bar, with uh, Planck's constant divided by 2 pi, we can simplify it to this expression here. The remarkable uh, feature of this expression for the energies En is that the energy depends on N itself. And that means if we go to wave functions with a higher N, that they have higher energies. So the energy goes up as we count up the wave functions with the N. These energies uh, are called uh, eigenenergies or energy eigenvalues and that basically means uh, allowed energies that the electron can have. And so what we ended up with here is that the electron can only have certain discrete energy values. And the reason for that is that the electron is confined, right? If we wouldn't have had the uh, boundary conditions here that the wave functions need to be zero outside A and, 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 and zero, then um, we wouldn't have been limited to these uh, sign functions that have to be zero at the boundaries. And so this here introduced that we got these, this discrete set of wave functions and with that came discrete uh, energies. So the lesson here is that as soon as we confine an electron with a potential, the energy values that this electron can have will be quantized. They will be discrete. So the electron could not accept energy that would put it somewhere in between E1 and E2. It would simply refuse to take the energy. So you can only get it from wave function 1 to wave function 2 if you would give it the difference between E2 and E1 exactly. Then it could accept the energy and change its wave function from 1 to 2. It's also interesting to uh, remember now Bohr's shell model. 
Bohr predicted that the electron could only have certain uh, orbits around the uh, nucleus around the proton and with that of course certain discrete energies and so he basically inferred from the uh, emission spectra from hydrogen that there would be these discrete uh, energy values but of course at that point it couldn't be fully explained why but now here you see with this quantum mechanical treatment it comes naturally out of the uh, solutions of the Schrodinger equation. The eigenenergies also uh, show clearly that the ground state energy of the electron cannot be zero if the electron is confined. And that corresponds neatly with Bohr's uh, prediction that there is a ground state uh, orbit and the electron cannot get closer to the uh, proton. So this here also explains why atoms don't collapse uh, by uh, bonding the electron directly to the uh, proton. So now we know that the electron can only have discrete energy values, that there is a set of wave functions that are solutions of the Schrodinger equation, and these wave functions need to be zero at the boundaries of the infinite potential well, because the potential was infinite, and the absolute square of the wave functions gives us a probability density distribution across this uh, potential well, and that tells us where we can find the electron. So the electron will be most likely at the uh, bellies of this uh, probability density function. And at the nodes, there is essentially a probability zero to find the electron. So it will never be here, but it will be found most likely here in between if it had an energy that corresponds to the uh, third wave function. Now, it's interesting to look at how the spacing between the energy values changes as we go up with the uh, n index. And so you can calculate that by calculating delta E is just E of n plus 1 minus E of n, and we end up with this here. And so you see that it goes with 2n plus 1. So the spacing between the energy values gets ever larger as we go to higher uh, wave functions. By now we know what happens to the electron when it is confined by a potential. An interesting question now is what does the Schrödinger equation yield for a particle, for an electron that is not confined? And an easy way to look at it is to simply extend the solutions of the infinite potential well to a case where we let A go to infinity. Right, so we just make the infinite potential well really big and that then uh, approximates a free electron that is not confined at all. And if you look at our solutions of the wave functions, if A gets really big, then the wave functions essentially go to zero. So in, in the extreme, the probability to find the electron at a location x goes to zero right, if this uh, potential well gets really big. And this would mean, of course, that the electron could be anywhere in space, or on the x-axis in this case. So what would happen to the eigenenergies? If A gets really big, then uh, first of all, we would note that we can have a, a ground state that is zero, right? If A is infinite, then E1 would be zero. What we also see is that the spacing between the uh, uh, eigenenergies would also go to zero. And so we would end up with a continuum of energy states. So there would be essentially spacing zero between them. And this would mean the electron could have any energy it wants. Now that we know the solutions of the infinite potential well, it's interesting to consider Heisenberg's uncertainty principle in the context of the infinite potential well. The uncertainty principle states that you cannot know the location and the momentum of a particle at the same time along a given coordinate axis. We can get an idea how the uncertainty principle comes about if we look at the infinite potential well. We know now that in the infinite potential well, the electron will be between zero and A. So this is our delta X. How about the momentum? 
from the, the Broglie relationship, we know that the momentum is Planck's number divided by the wavelengths, and if we plug in for the wavelengths 2 pi divided by the wave number k, and uh, Planck's number is 2 times pi Planck's number bar, then uh, we can say that the momentum is Planck's number bar times k. Since the electron can move to the left or to the right, we can say that uh, delta p is just two times this uh, expression for the momentum. k we know from the uh, solutions of the Schrödinger equation, and so we plug in kn is n times pi divided by a, and we assume we are in the ground state, so n is 1. So with this we end up, if we multiply delta p with delta x, that it is just equal to uh, Planck's number. So in the case of the infinite potential well, we are a little bit bigger than uh, h bar divided by 2. But that's why it says here larger or equal. Let's consider now what happens if the potential well is not infinite. So the difference to the infinite potential well is now that we have finite potentials v0. The general solutions to the Schrödinger equation in region 2 will be the same as the results we got for the infinite potential well because the potential is zero. What will be different is that on the outside here in regions 1 and 3 the uh, wave functions now are not uh, zero anymore because the potential is not infinite. And so if one writes down the Schrödinger equation for this problem now for regions 1 and 3 we need to deal with uh, E minus V zero. So if we do the same approach, like for region 2, and we define a new constant here, here we call it uh, alpha, and alpha is 2m times e minus v0 divided by Planck's number bar squared, then we realize, because v0 is larger than e in region 1, this here is negative. And so we can write this by putting the minus sign here out in the open in front of the alpha and turning around here the uh, terms in the subtraction. So we subtract the energy from the uh, potential V0 so that this here remains positive. Now when you look at it, this minus sign, this here makes the uh, differential equation look like the differential equation we know for the damped harmonic oscillator. And because of that, the solutions here are exponential functions. And so what we get is a situation where the wave functions decay into regions 1 and 3 as exponential functions. In practical terms, this means that there is a certain probability to find the electron inside the uh, potential regions. So the electron can enter here. But the probability to find it gets lower and lower the further away we go from the uh, potential well. What this also means is that because of the boundary conditions, the solutions for region 2 inside the well need to be smoothly connecting to the exponential decay functions. And that means that the wavelengths get a little bit longer in comparison to the infinite potential well. And with that, the eigenenergy values, the eigenenergies, they get a little bit lower. And that means that the ground stage is below the ground stage we would have for the infinite potential well. You can look at this as a intermediate stage between the infinite potential well and the free electron. If we would lower the potential here towards zero, then gradually we would change from the confined electron to the free electron. And that would mean that in the end, when the potential is zero, the ground state would be at zero. So there is a tr smooth transition between the ground state energy of the infinite potential well and the free electron as we change the uh, potential here. Now you know that if the electron has an energy that is lower than a finite potential, the wave functions are exponential decay functions. So let's discuss what happens if we have a tunneling barrier. So here we have a region that has a potential V0 that is flanked by potential free regions 1 and 3. So if an electron now came at an energy that is lower than, than that potential V0 and would approach this tunneling barrier, its wave function would decay exponentially through that tunneling barrier 
and then emerge on, on the other side with a smaller amplitude. In practical terms, this means that there is a non-zero probability to find the electron on the other side of this tunneling barrier. So there's a probability that it tunnels through it, and for this we can determine a transmission coefficient t. And if the barrier is wide enough and high enough, then this transmission coefficient can be approximated with an exponential function multiplied with a constant. And the exponential function depends on the height of the barrier and the width of the barrier. Right here the v0 goes into alpha and a is the uh, width. So the wider the barrier and the lower the energy of the electron, the less likely it gets to tunnel through here and correspondingly the higher the energy of the electron and the more narrow the barrier, the, li the more likely it gets that the electron tunnels through here. It's interesting to compare the situation with the classical case. If you consider this little guy here in this card, if he would cast off at A and then bounce over B and go up this hill, which would correspond to the tunneling barrier, in the quantum mechanical case, of course, he would never make it beyond C. Even if there is no friction, uh, he would just go back down here. So there is no probability at all that he could ever make it over to E. So in the quantum mechanical case, for a small particle like the electron, this is entirely different. Even if the energy is lower than an obstacle that's in the way, there's still a probability that the electron can make it through. A great application of the tunneling effect is in a scanning tunneling microscope. You already saw pictures that came out of such a microscope when I showed you the uh, surface reconstruction of the silicon 7x7 surface. Here's how it works. The tunneling barrier is essentially now vacuum and we have a tip that is made from metal and then we have the sample that is also metal and we keep tip and sample in a small distance which is typically about one nanometer or so and here we get this uh, tunneling barrier so here you see it in with atomic resolution schematically so the tip essentially ends in one single atom it's a little bit an art to make a tip like that but it can be done and uh, the sample surface, if prepared properly, is just a flat layer of atoms. And when this tip is being scanned across the surface, then the tunneling current between tip and sample, right, there's a voltage applied and this distance here is one nanometer, so we have this tunneling barrier in between tip and sample. So the tunneling current now varies depending on whether the tip is on top of an atom or in between the atoms in a, a hollow. And this change of the current can be measured with a sensitive amplifier and can be recorded in a computer depending on the uh, position where we are with the, with the uh, tip. And with that we get uh, a bunch of lines that contain the information where is an atom and where are the regions in between atoms. And if one does that with a fine enough resolution and assembles everything with a computer, then you can get pictures of a surface like this here. And here you can see there is an atom and this here are the regions in between. So with this scanning tunneling microscope, for the first time one could actually see atoms directly. Before I discuss the hydrogen atom, let's have a look what happens if we solve the Schrödinger equation for a three-dimensional problem. So let's go back to the infinite potential well just in three dimensions. You see it here. So we have a box with the lengths a, b and c and inside the box the potential is zero and outside it is infinite. In order to get the wave functions for this problem we need to solve the Schrödinger equation in three dimensions. I showed it to you already. The only thing that changed is that we have here now three partial derivatives instead of the single uh, second order derivative in x direction. This here can be solved with an approach that's called separation of variables. This means we can start guessing the solution by uh, using a product of three sine waves with different k wave numbers, one for x, one for y, one for z directions. 
using the same approach with boundary conditions, we can then determine that the uh, k numbers are n1 pi divided by a, n2 pi divided by b, and n3 pi divided by c. So we get three of them, and we also get uh, three n's, three quantum numbers. Because we have three dimensions now, we get three quantum numbers. So basically what happened here is that we have a three-dimensional sine wave. It's a little bit difficult to imagine, but it matches the box with knots at the boundaries to the infinite potential regions in x and y and z direction. The determination of the constant a, the amplitude of the uh, function, is uh, done again with the normalization condition and for a square box we get a is the square root of uh, 2 divided by a uh, cubed. The eigenenergies also look very similar to the one-dimensional problem, except that now we have the uh, sum between three terms that contain a, b, and c, and the uh, three quantum numbers. For a square box, this simplifies into an expression that is very similar to the one-dimensional case, except that the n now is the sum of the squares of the individual quantum numbers. One more thing about the square box. If we have this expression here for the energy eigenvalues, it's obvious that there are many values that yield the same n squared. In fact, if you have quantum numbers that are like this here, 1, 1, 2, or 1, 2, 1, or 2, 1, 1, if you have such permutations of the same numbers, then the energies are the same. And there's a term for that. It's called degeneracy. And so you would say these energy values are threefold degenerate. And this concludes the first part of chapter 3. Thanks for watching.